I'm going to Proverbs 13 in my Bible. Will you go there too? And I just want you to let the thought of a few verses here sort of linger in your minds as we begin our study tonight. This is Proverbs 13, and I'm down at verse 13, where the wise man writes, The one who despises the word will be in debt to it, but the one who fears the commandment will be rewarded. And then verse 14 adds, The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to turn aside from the snares of death. And then 15, good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. Ponder those. I met Ricky in the spring of 1988. I didn't know him at all. In fact, his father had arranged for the two of us to get together that first time. And so it was during that first meeting that we just sort of told our stories and got acquainted with each other, figured out where we each had, had come from. And as we did that, it was remarkable to find how similar our upbringings had been. Both of us claimed Texas as home, even though he had grown up in a little East Texas town called Mount Pleasant. I guess every state has a Mount Pleasant somewhere, right? Maybe not Nevada, I don't know. And I had grown up in the the suburbs of Houston, so we were miles apart in return to that, But, but both of us were, in our hearts, Texans. And we both came from church going families. My family helped begin the Kleinwood Church when I was at elementary school back in 1976. And His family had worshipped at the Southside Church right there on the main street running through Mount Pleasant. And we were both encouraged at a very young age to get involved in the congregation's activities. And interestingly enough, in the same way, we had an old song leader named Billy Goff. And when I was 14, 15 years old, he kind of twisted my arm and got me started leading singing. And and interestingly, that's kind of what happened with Ricky too. His, His dad... His dad had a a full-time job during the week, but on the weekend he would go out to a little wide spot in the road called Cooper's Chapel, Texas, and and he would do some preaching for this little group of mostly older people on Sundays. And when Ricky was a teenage boy, he would take him along. He'd have Ricky do the singing while while, while he would do the preaching. I, I learned later that this little spot is really their family homestead, that they had that they had been on that little plot of ground for three or four or five generations. And so, as we got to know each other, we realized that our backgrounds were very similar. And yet, there we sat, similar in so many ways, just feet from each other at this first meeting, and I tell you folks, we couldn't have been further apart. I was a young preacher, barely in my 20s, just beginning my adult life, and starting out in my very first work as a preacher at Huntsville, Texas. While Ricky was a 30-year-old convicted murderer making his way through the legal process that would end his life. Which just kind of leaves you wondering, How two people with such similar upbringing and so many advantages could end up in such drastically different places. Michael Grachek covered death row in Huntsville for the Associated Press for for decades. And when he met with Ricky, his question was, how does the son of a guy who preaches end end up on death row? How does that happen? Candidly, I don't know that there is an uncomplicated answer to that question. But if you ask Ricky, and we talked about it a lot, he would always begin in the same place. He would take you back to his freshman year of high school when he was 15 years old. And what Ricky would say is that that's where it all started with the choice that he made to run with the wrong crowd. That choice had consequences. It carried a price. Immediately, he began to face pressure to do things that his whole life he believed were wrong, to drink and 
to use drugs and to become involved in sex. And over time, that pressure mounted and he caved because he wanted to be with that crowd. In fact, in one of the letters he wrote me, he described it this way. He said, before I knew it, I was in with the ways of the world. Talking about sex, dope, drinking, and thinking my parents didn't know what they were talking about, telling me not to do their this or that, and I didn't want someone telling me how to run my life. Ever heard that before? But he said, as I look back on it now, my friends were running my life. With 15 years to reflect, Ricky looked back and saw this moment as the pivotal moment in his life where everything changed for him. Ignoring the warning of his parents, he continued to run with the wrong crowd throughout high school. He used and abused every kind of drug, though marijuana became his drug of choice. He was sexually immoral, constantly in financial trouble, in and out of debt. In fact, he kind of sort of, he described for me what his life was during the decade of his 20s. He said, I'd go out and get a job, and I'd work the job for a little while, and I would set aside everything I could that it didn't take to live. And he said, when I'd have a little nest egg after three or four months, I'd quit the job and go party. And you understand we're not going to talk about cake and ice cream, right? He'd go party with his friends and he would use drugs. And when the money had all played out, he said, I'd go find another job again and and work it for a while and repeat that cycle over and over again. And that was his life all through his 20s. Until the spring of 1987, when Ricky would figure out how far this path was going to take him and how terribly destructive it would prove to be. In the spring of 87, he was on the downside of the cycle. He was broke. And I mean, I mean, not like he's struggling to buy the groceries. He's so broke, he's living in his car at the state park, okay? More importantly to the story, he is out of money for drugs. And that's a problem. But he was with a woman who said she knew where they could get some quick money to buy more drugs. Because back in her hometown, there was this guy named Carl that owned a grocery store who always carried a big wad of bills in his pocket. And so they planned to rob Carl. And the robbery did not go according to the plan. And that 22-year-old grocery store owner was killed. It did not take them long to figure out who had done this, nor did it take long for the jury to reach a verdict in his trial later that November. He was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to die and sent out to the Ellis unit in Huntsville, Texas, where he would spend the next 11 years waiting for the lawyers to work their way through the process. That would end his life. And that's where our lives intersected. I had moved to Huntsville to work with a little church there, and Ricky had been sent to prison. And when his daddy found out I was there, he called me late one night and introduced himself and said, would you go study with my son? And we did. I think it was about two more years that he and I studied together, and then I moved off to Chicago. And so for for about nine years, we corresponded back and forth, wrote letters to each other until until the summer of 1999. It was July that I got this letter from him. I think, I think from that very first meeting, we knew that there would come a day when he would send a letter like this. He said, Dear David and family, how are you? Fine, I hope and pray. Myself, I am very nervous. I'm in touch with the Lord this day more so than I've ever been. My heart feels like I can't get it to pump enough blood, and my hand feels like it wants to start shaking, but I'm holding fast to the word of the Lord. Just today I was formed of my execution date. 
I will go to be with the saints that are awaiting for the day of judgment on August 4th, 1999. Well, brother, I'm sorry this letter is so short, but I have much people to tell this to, so take care and remain strong as I'm trying to do. God bless you. Love, Ricky Don. It was on August 4th, 1999, that the state of Texas executed Ricky for the murder of Carl Wrinkle. We buried him in the little cemetery right by that old church building where he used to lead singing at Cooper's Chapel. I had a chance to go out with him and spend those last three days before his execution with him. And so we sat there visiting in the room there at the Ellis unit and talked about lots and lots of things. But if there was one thing that he emphasized more than any other, it was his hope that, that somehow people would learn from the tragedy that was his life. He had a special passion for, for young people. And I don't think that's hard to figure out. I think he looked back and saw so many of his troubles as beginning in his youth with the choices that he made. And so I think he just hoped somehow that if young people could, could hear his story, maybe it would help them avoid making some of the mistakes that he made along the way. But, but as I look back and think about all those years we spent visiting through that little window in the visiting room at the Ellis Unit, it occurred to me that I'd heard Ricky preach a lot of sermons that would never be heard in church buildings like this, uh, sermons that we need to hear. And so admittedly tonight, I'm using borrowed material. I'll just own up to that. I'd like to preach some of his lessons for you, uh, to say some of the things that I think he'd like to say to you if he could speak to this crowd tonight. And relevant to the subject of temptation, I think they are things that will help us weather that storm. Because brothers and sisters, that's not a storm we may not, may, that we may face. That is a storm we will face. And we'll face it today in some big way or small way. And we'll face it tomorrow. And we face it every single day. This is not a storm that might come. It does come. And all the time. And I would suggest to you that there are some things in this story that will help us as we struggle with the storms of temptation. So, let me share with you some things that I picked from the letters he sent to me while he was on death row. Uh, three points, going to tuck in a scripture here and there. So, these aren't like literally three lessons, so we're not going to be here for an hour and a half, okay? Uh, three lessons, a couple of passages along the way, and I'll be done. First of all, if Ricky could talk to us, I think he would absolutely want to say to everybody, that the crowd matters. Do you see where he's going with that? Of all the sermons I heard him preach, I think the one I heard more frequently than any other was this one. The crowd matters. And can you see why he would say that? Remember, as he looked back on his life, that's where all this began. A choice in the ninth grade about the crowd. In fact, this is what he said in one of his letters to me. He said, I was baptized at 15 years old. And I helped my dad by leading singing every Sunday. As I got older, I started to have friends that were not Christians. And some of the things I did were fun. Some of the things I didn't want to do, but my friends would say, come on, it won't hurt you, or, or what's the matter? You, you're scared? And, and, and I thought it was okay. He said, I started smoking cigarettes because my friends did. I started drinking because they did. And when I was in the ninth grade, I was introduced to smoking dope because my friend said, oh, you'll like it. And I did. And I was in with the ways of the world. I got to tell you, folks, it's that part of the story that I think haunts me more than any other part. To think that a man looking back on his 30 years on this earth could say that it was a choice made in the ninth grade about friends that defined the rest of the disaster. So if he could speak to us, he would want to say 
The crowd matters. And God warns us about that. So I'm headed back to Proverbs 1, if you'll go there in your Bible. We read a little bit of this earlier. In Proverbs chapter 1, Solomon opens by giving us the same caution. This is Proverbs 1 and verse 8, where he says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. So he begins by saying in 8 and 9, listen to mom and dad, right? But then look at the contrast, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even old as those who go down to the pit. We will have all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us, and we'll have one purse. There's a crowd of wicked people out there in Solomon's day who might tempt some young person to say, hey, come join us in a life of crime. Come join our gang. You'll get a lot of great stuff, free stuff. Won't have to work for it. Solomon says in verse 15, My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the baited net in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. Listen to the rest of that. And they ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. I have always thought about Ricky when I've read this passage. The warning in verse 10 is, if sinners entice you, don't consent. Because if you do, verse 18, you will ambush your life. That is exactly what he did. He listened to the wrong crowd. He got off onto their path. And he destroyed his life. Literally destroyed his life. We see something similar in the New Testament. I'm headed over to John 12. Will you go there? John chapter 12, verse 42. John 12, 42. John writes, nevertheless, even many of the rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. This is a remarkable text that I think we pass over too quickly. Notice it says that these rulers believed in Jesus. Think about that. That means they had heard his teaching. And they'd had an opportunity to consider his claim. And they had even reached a conclusion. The text says they believed him. They believed that what he was saying was true. Think about that. They believed he was the Son of God. But the text says they wouldn't confess it. They wouldn't openly acknowledge that. It says why? Because they would be put out of the synagogue. Listen, confessing Jesus at that time had consequences with people who were important to them. The text says... For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. They were more concerned about the crowd than they were with Christ. And they make this utterly foolish decision that astonishes us today. They reject the one they know to be the Lord because they feared the crowd. And we look at that and we think how foolish that is. But do you know we do the same thing? Every time we allow wicked influences in our lives to pull us into sin, we are choosing the crowd over Christ. And what Ricky would want to do right now is stand up and say, yes, and you're headed for a lot of trouble. He would say the crowd matters, and it does, folks. Over about the last decade, I have been doing some informal research among young people who grew up among us and left the Lord. And I've been surveying them to find out some of the reasons that that happens. And one of the things that they tell me over and over again, without exception, every single one has said, the crowd played a significant role in my fall, in my loss of faith. The crowd matters. And I know that I'm telling you something you've heard before. I'm sure you guys have heard mom and dad talk about the crowd. Maybe some of you have had friends and mom and dad said, I don't like that friend. I don't want you spending time with him. I'm sure you've been in Bible classes where somebody has brought up the danger of evil influences. Maybe quoted 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil companions corrupt good marriage. I'm good morals. I'm sure from this pulpit, someone has sat up and stood up here and, and warned about the crowd. I, I guess Ricky just hoped that coming from someone in his position, maybe his warning would carry a little weight. The 
crowd matters. In this battle with temptation, crowd matters. We need to surround ourselves. All of us do. We need to surround ourselves with a good crowd. A crowd that will help us get to heaven. All right, I need to move on and talk about something else. Because if Ricky could talk to you, I think he would also want to say to you that, that parents matter. He'd want to say to the young people in the crowd, especially, that your parents matter. Some of the most moving conversations I had with him were about his mom and dad. Ricky, Ricky loved his mother and father. In fact, one of the really difficult things for him about being in prison was that he was able to spend so little time with them. In fact, his mom and dad lived up here in Enid. And he was down in prison in Huntsville. It was a nine-hour drive. And they were older people. And they would drive down as much as they could. They would drive nine hours down. They would visit for four hours and drive nine hours back. Did you do the math? I mean, that's a whole day. They came as much as they could, but it was never enough. He missed his mom and dad. It was frustrating that he could never hug his mother. Because once you go into the death row system in Texas, there is no physical contact with outsiders, not ever again. And so, and so you see some pretty pathetic sights in the visiting room there at the Ellis unit. You see the, the hands pressing against that window, longing for contact that's not ever going to happen. Sometimes I'd sit down and I'd have to wipe off the lipstick where a loved one had, had kissed the window trying to kiss their loved one. Isn't that kind of sad? It frustrated him that he could never interact and, and hug his mother again. I think his worst moment came in 1993 because his dad had a heart attack and died unexpectedly. And nobody could come and comfort him. And he could not go and comfort his mother. And he worried about her when his execution was close. She was in bad health and he worried how all of that might affect her. He really loved his mom and dad. But there was a lengthy period of his life where he did not value them. And I think he would be honest with you about that. Because you need to know, his parents were not indulgent parents. They just didn't sort of sit back and watch as his, as his life went off the cliff. What, they did, what he did, he did over their intense protest. In fact, one of his letters he wrote to me, he said this, Daddy would tell me, you're going to get into trouble if you keep living like you are. But I didn't think so. Remember? He didn't want anybody telling him how to live his life. In fact, I still remember, I still remember our first visit when he got to that part of the story, watching the tears begin to well up in his eyes and roll down his cheeks as he gritted his teeth and said to me, he said, David, I wish I had listened to my dad. It's too late. It was too late for him, but not for you. And so in telling us parents matter, you know already that he's just echoing what Scripture already said, right? Parents are given a sacred duty by the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. To summarize that, God says, Teach them my will and make sure they do it. It's a sacred call of every parent. In fact, I want to let you guys in on something about your mom and dad. I'm going to let you in on a secret about your parents that they probably don't want you to know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. After you guys go to bed at night, your parents go back in their room and they shut the door. And sometimes they sit up for hours talking and plotting what they're going to do tomorrow to make your life miserable. Do you all realize that? And if you believe that, you're probably wrong about a whole lot of other stuff to do, uh, too. Because the truth is, your parents do go back in their room after you go to bed, and they do close the door. What do we do? We sit around, and we wring our hands, and we fret, and we worry, and we try to figure out how to get this parenting thing right. I just don't know godly parents who don't really care about getting it right. And we don't! We just mess up along the way, and we don't do it right. But that's okay. You don't execute being a kid perfectly either. 
We're all doing this imperfectly, trying to do our best. But the point is, that's what mom and dad want. They want to do their best. They want to get this right with you. And they have this benefit, these years of experience that they just want to share and help so that you'll avoid some of those pitfalls that are out there. And so Scripture says something to young people about that. If you go back to the book of Proverbs, remember? That's where he began in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. He said, hear my son your father's instruction, and do not neglect your mother's teaching, right? In fact, it says in verse 9, there'll be a blessing to you. You need to listen to that. And then over in the New Testament in Ephesians, in Ephesians 6, in verse 1, Paul would say, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long, on the earth. I think we have been really good about emphasizing verse 1 with kids and the need to obey. They're your parents, you have to do what they say, right? I do not think we have done a very good job emphasizing the higher principle of verse 2. The principle of honor of teaching kids to value their parents. That's really what the word means, and there's something critical there that goes right to the heart, that says what my parents say, what my parents offer is important to me. I tell young people, if you have never changed your mind about something based on the input of your mom and dad, you're not doing what that verse says, because that's exactly what it's about, attaching great value to who they are and what they say so that their thinking and counsel would alter your behavior in some way. And then he gives the promise in verse 3, if you'll do that, life is going to be better for you. You'll live long on the earth. I realize that's not a guarantee, but I tell you what, Ricky Blackman would probably still be here today if he'd listened to his mom and dad. He did not live long on the earth. I'm not saying everyone who doesn't listen to their parents would end up on death row. If that was true, I probably wouldn't need to preach a sermon. But if you don't listen, you may end up with some friends that get you into trouble. Or married to someone who makes you miserable. Or you may lose your soul. Don't make the mistake that Ricky made of ignoring the pleas of loving parents until you're in a big mess looking back and saying what Ricky said. I wish I'd listened to my mom and dad. If he could speak to us tonight, he'd want to say that. He'd want to say parents matter. And then one more and I'm going to be done. The last thing I think he would want to say is sin matters. I say that because he never imagined that his life would end up the way that it did. He never thought that those first seemingly small steps in the wrong direction, I mean experimenting with drugs and alcohol in high school, people would say, well that's just a rite of passage that teenagers go through. And then running with that terrible crowd, and he never imagined that those first little steps would lead to all of this. In fact, he told me, he said um, he can remember the first time after he was convicted going to the state prison, and he said, I I was sent to this cell, and those big iron doors slammed shut behind me, and he said, I just buried my head in my hands. And he said, I wept and asked myself, how did I ever get to this place? This wasn't where he was planning to go with his life. And he never dreamed that his choices would be so terribly expensive. And I need to say to you, honestly, part of the reason for that is for a good bit of his life, it didn't appear that he was that he was paying any price at all for his sins. He ran with the worst people. He was involved in all kinds of sexual immorality. He used and abused drugs, lived that party life for a decade. 
for 10 years. That's how it went on. And if you don't mind sleeping in your car when your flat broke, that's about as bad as it got for him. Until that one night. And it was the friends, and it was the drugs, and it was the life that all came together in the wrong way, and and, and it just had these disastrous consequences. He's paid the ultimate price. It was interesting to talk to him about what was hard about being in prison. I had some presuppositions about that. I imagined that the hard thing about being in prison was worried that the guy sleeping in the bunk above you would cut your throat in the middle of the night. That happens. He never talked about being afraid. Never talked about threats to his physical safety. He talked about not being able to hug his mother. And sometimes I would come in on Monday... And when we sit down and talk, he would say, you guys partook of the Lord's Supper yesterday, right? He would say, I really miss that. I never get to partake of communion anymore. And he would talk about looking out the prison and being able to see trees in the distance and ponds that were on the prison property. And he could remember going camping and fishing when he was a kid. And he missed that so much things that he knew he would never do again. And then there was the process. Once you've been on death row for a few years, you begin to get a feel for how the process works because other people are way ahead of you in the process. And so he would watch other inmates that would be finishing their legal process. And and, and so the day would come when they would take people that he knew and, and they wouldn't come back. And so over the years, Ricky worked his process. He actually received a number of execution dates that he didn't didn't concern himself with. He knew that he wasn't at that place in the process. But in July of 99, when that one came, he knew it was over. He was at the end of the process. He knew he had a month to live. And then a week. And then the last three days. And then the last day, Wednesday, that's the day he said goodbye to his mom. He did not want her to attend the execution. And then the last moments, when that chemical concoction was being injected in his veins that would rob him of life. I've just never seen anybody go through something like that. And I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not asking you to feel sorry for Ricky. If you want to have grief for someone, Carl's mother, a good lady, his victim's mother, she has suffered for decades because of his terrible crime. Feel sorry for her. Ricky paid the price he deserved to pay for the crime that he committed. My point is, he never saw that coming. He never imagined that these choices would take him so far into this pit and would cost so much. And so in that, for me and you, there's a warning. You know, sin promises some stuff that it doesn't deliver. Will you go back to Proverbs again? Proverbs chapter 1. Do you remember seeing that in the reading we did together? In Proverbs 1 and verse 11, that, that, that crowd of sinners says, Come with us, let us lie away to blood, let us ambush the innocent without cause, let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even old do those go down to the pit. Listen to 13. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We will have one verse. That's the message. Sin's got all this stuff to offer you. But the warning in verse 15 is, do not walk in the way with them. Verse 18. They ambush their lives. It is not going to work out well with you. The way of the transgressor, gression, mm, the way of the transgressor, I'll get it right, is hard. Folks, this is as old as Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan's trying to tell Eve, hey, you eat this tree, everything's going to be great. It wasn't. In Psalm 1. There's the contrast between the the path of the righteous and the path of the wicked. It's crystal clear. The righteous flourish. 
the wicked are destroyed. Sin promises what it does not deliver. In the end, it only disappoints. You know who knew that? King David. Who would have ever thought that so much awfulness could come from a simple moral failure? Remember that rooftop incident in Jerusalem? Catches a glimpse of Bathsheba bathing. What's his moral failure? He looks too long. Who would ever begin with that opening scene and say, oh, I know this is going to end. This is going to end with him killing somebody, right? Who would have thought that? And yet that is exactly what happens to David. Sin took him further than he ever imagined going, and boy, was the price not awful with all of that. And so the same thing that happens to me and you. We imagine that we can, we can dabble in sin just a little bit and not get hurt. And so, and so people, when they're young, they listen to culture. And culture says, you know, when you're young, you need to experiment. You need to smoke a little pot. Everybody does that until they get hooked on this stuff. And end up like Ricky, killing people to support a habit. And if not that, more often what happens is people just just inherit from that a lifelong addiction that consumes them for the rest of their lives. Or people think that they can be recreational about sex because culture says, hey, everybody's going to sleep around when they're young. That's just what kids do. We just need to tell them how to do it safely. That's the message of our culture. And so people get involved in sexual immorality and all of a sudden there's a disease or pregnancy that statistically totally alters the trajectory of a young person's life. No, they don't tell you that. But it's nonetheless true. Sin takes us further than we plan to go and costs us more than we ever plan to to pay. The, the, The mantra of our culture is that sin is no big deal. That is a lie. It's not just a lie. It is a lie that everyone ultimately figures out. The question is, how much damage will I do before I figure it out? Well, Ricky did a lot of damage. So if he could speak to us, he would want to say, don't be fooled about this. Sin really does matter. It is a big deal. Can I tell you how big a deal it is? It's such a big deal that God sent His Son, Jesus, so that He could be the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world. It is a story, the gospel story, that communicates how horrific sin really is and that communicates how much God desires to rescue us from our death sentence. Because the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, Every one of us of an accountable age is living with a death sentence. The sentence of the the second death that comes with the choice to sin. Separation from God forever. And yet in Jesus Christ, God has offered a reprieve to you and me. We can't imagine a condemned man being offered a reprieve by the governor and turning away and rejecting it, can we? How much more bizarre that someone would sit in this crowd tonight facing the second death and turn away the reprieve that is offered in Jesus Christ. God wants to rescue you tonight. And if you are caught up in sin, He'll help you get out of it. If that's your need, then you let it be moaned tonight. We'll help you tonight. God will help you tonight. You make your way to the front right now while we stand, while we sing. Thank you.